Hey everybody, it's Andre from the Eagle Soft Field Guide here. I'm uh, here with Katie. Hey Katie, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, and we've actually met in person. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, you're not too far from me, but with uh, the Pennsylvania order to stay in inside, I guess I won't see you anytime soon, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad you joined me today. We're gonna do some uh, looking around with uh, coverage books and you guys use coverage books in your office? We do. Um, we use them for the uh, insurances that we're participating with. Cool. All right. So one of the things that we're going to talk about today is, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about coverage books. I go in offices all the time and, you know, coverage books are, are typically used uh, in network, out of network, both ways. Um, what I typically do is when I set up offices, I don't use a lot of coverage books and I'll, I'll explain to you why. Um, but I don't use a lot of coverage books because um, when I'm in network um, and the office I worked in, you know, back in the stone age when I worked in a dental office, we were in network with everybody. Right. But we didn't use a lot of coverage books because I could um, figure out percentages based on the, I could find, figure out estimations based on the percentages. Um, and then those weird procedures like posterior resins, I couldn't based on percentages. So that's when I used coverage books. Okay. So 99% uh, of my offices use fee schedules along with about 1% uh, coverage books. And I'll okay. tell you how that works when we look at this. So for those who don't know what we're talking about, uh, if we go to list and we go to the coverage book list, now, remember, I'm looking at a, a, this is a demo software and not a, a real office, but, you know, we have coverage books. So to give you an example of a coverage book, let me just pick this one out. And whenever I make a coverage book, um, I actually list it as the name of the employer, the insurance company that employers are attached to, and then the group number. So I know that this one's only for KWTX, which is a TV station, and they have Delta Dental, and that's their actual group number. So it's very, very specific to that employer, to that insurance company, to that group. Because if they, if K, uh, KWTX ever leaves Delta, that coverage book's no longer any good and I can just delete it. Okay. And so everybody knows you can delete a coverage book. It's, it, you know, you don't have to have um, people out of the system or anything like that. It will just get rid of the coverage book and it's gone forever. But let's look at that coverage book. And again, like I said, I typically only use it for posterior resins. And the way that this is set up is so that my um, 2393 posterior one, uh, three surface, um, I'm allowed to charge my patients a hundred bucks, which is the allowance for a three surface amalgam. And that three surface amalgam is covered at 80%. And this will automatically give me the right percentage for this procedure. So I don't need to do more than that because anything else other than the other posterior resins are going to be covered under the percentages that are in the system um, and they're going to be based on the allowance and not based on a, you know, a separate code like a like amalgam. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So you can see, like, if I look at almost every one of these you can see there's just like one or two codes in every one of these examples that I have here, you know, because a lot of times even a, a posterior crown will be something that um, doesn't follow a particular uh, pattern. Um, I don't know why I even have this. I think I was showing somebody how to do this over here. Um, but let's go into an employer. So let's go to list and let's go to employers and let's pull up AARP, because that's one that almost everybody has. I'll use this one. And as you can see, um, actually, bad example, but maybe we'll, we'll figure it out. So uh, I always start from how I kind of set up everyone in my employers. And I have AARP. Then in brackets, I always put the last date that I updated my information. So I can tell this one's already outdated, because this was updated in March of 2019. So now that we're working on it, I'm gonna make this 2020. All right, I also know that I can't use a patient's social security number for this plan because right there it says PID, that means I need a patient member ID number in order to be able to process a claim through this employer. All right, um, don't need an address. 
don't need a group name, but I do have a group number in there. And I always make sure that everyone puts every single digit they can find on um, an EOB in that space. Deductible and max, and I know guys, this is not the real AARP, this is just what I made up. Um, and then my insurance company. Notice my Delta Dental of PA, and you're in PA too, so I'm sure you see a lot of these, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. So my Delta of PA has a plus sign after it. That way I know it's the good Delta Dental of PA, and if I click on my employer list, you can tell how I can tell from my list. So I can see Delta Dental PA, 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 Pencil, Panel yeah. Pencil, all right. So, and I think one of these Delta Dental of Pennsylvania is, oh, you see that one is yeah. different than that one, all right. Only because this one says POB and this one says PO Box. Okay. And we see this all the time when we look at offices. So I know that this one with the plus sign after it is one that I've vetted. I know that that has a good uh, telephone number, that the address is correct, everything's good about that. Um, and if I edit that, it even has the correct payment group, claim payer ID, everything's good about this. So I know that this is a good one and the claim will actually make it to Delta and everything was gonna work out really well. So that's okay. why I put the plus sign there. So. Okay. I can tell after a while, if I look through my list, that that's a good one, that's a copy, and then I would have cleaned up these as I go, but I, I want everybody to see how I know that that's my good Delta PA. So I know that my employer is good, I know my insurance is good. Now, the next things we have to do is connect the fee schedules and coverage books. So, do you guys, are you PPO or are you Premier for Delta? Um, we are both. Both, okay. And you've got multiple doctors in your office too, so that makes yes. a difference too. Yeah. So if I hit my um, fee schedule, I would pick my Delta Premier or Delta PPO, whichever one you're in. So we happen to like, we do most of it on PPO because okay. it Majority most PPO. people are PPO. Yep. So cool. And I have both of them in there and I can see the last time I've updated those fees. Um, and again, I, every time I look at my list, I can tell how clean they are, you know, and again, if I had somebody working with me in 2019, who's no longer there, who I don't trust their, <laughs> their ability to update fees, I right. can quickly look there and go, oh, that's right. Sally was here at that point. I got to fix this. Okay. So I grab my PPO fee schedule and then there's my coverage book that's in there. Now, again, I don't do a lot of coverage books because if you look at my service types. I've got a service type for just about everything. So do they cover nitrous? Do they cover general anesthesia? Do they cover diagnostics? Okay. I have this broken out so far. So there's endo basic, endo major. So maybe they cover molars, but they, you know, they cover anteriors differently. My guards, do they cover occlusal guards? Do they cover sleep guards? My implant services, do they cover the placement of the implant or do they cover the restoration of the implant? So in this example, they don't cover placement, but they cover any restoration at 50%. Right. So that's smart. Yeah. So I've taken this a little further than the, you know, the average. So maybe your simple extractions are covered, but surgical extractions aren't. Um, adult ortho is not covered or they are covering it. So this is great. So if I, you know, if I post Invisalign, um, it's going to show zero coverage as opposed to if I do bonding and bracketing my perio maintenance, my major perio, my minor perio. Uh, and again, each office can pick and choose what, how they sort of set that up. And then I have a category here for preventive non-covered services, which sounds weird because most times preventive is covered. But what I put in here would be my sealants Excuse for, me. oh, bless you, sealants you. for um, adults. Okay. So I have a code for sealants for people over 14, and that is connected to that preventive code, uh, preventive seal, uh, type. And there's sealants, and I have people offices where sealants are only covered in molars, so I can break that out too. So you can see I've got every conceivable thing here. All right. And there's my restorations on post resins, cuspids, and anteriors, so I can split them all out separately, and then do they apply to the deductible? Okay. Cool. And you guys saw the how the coverage book is set up here, but let's just add a service here so you can see. So if I do D2392, all right, I can show here what 
my maximum allowable charge. That's what the UCR means in this field is the maximum allowable charge under a PPO plan. All right, because we're talking PPOs. So yeah. let's just say the maximum allowable is a hundred bucks. All right. And I can put in here a dollar, I mean a copayment amount. All right. And actually this is set up for copayment. So I can put the actual copay here. Um, and then that will carry over to what the insurance is going to cover. So let's just say $25 to copay. Insurance is going to cover $75. And then we're writing off $75. And then does it apply to the deductible or not? Um, one thing I will tell you, and I think that's why I set up this example. Did you know that if um, you put a dollar amount in the coverage field, um, it will ignore all deductibles? Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah. I didn't know that until after I was actually a trainer. Uh, but one of the, uh, Jenny Allen actually taught me that, that if you put dollar amount in here, no matter what you put in this deductible applies field, it will automatically ignore the deductible. So, okay. uh, and that's why you saw my other example. I did it by percentage. So just be aware that anybody okay. who's using dollar amount here and they're wondering how come the deductible didn't show up. That's why. We tend to, we skip the copay part and we do percentage because Perfect. I couldn't figure out why it wasn't making it right, but that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So yeah, that, and I, like I said, I, I, I found that out later on, but typically, yeah, I wouldn't be using coverages. I'd be using this under percentages and setting that up as 80% of the amalgam fee automatically and applying the deductible. Okay. Um, yep. Let's get out of here. So now let's do a walkout on somebody and I'm going to look at a couple different things. Um, I have my system set up. Um, are you in front of one of your computers? Yes. Can you open up BeagleSoft just to see what your preferences are set? Um, I'm wondering, because a lot of people may or may not know this and just to find out how you are set up and I'll let some other people look at their systems. There is a line item in preferences and insurance and it's, there's a sister to it in the accounting thing. So I want everybody to know this. It says show standard fee and adjustment on walkout statements and treatment plans. All right. If you have that checked, you're going to show another column um, on your, or another line item on your walkouts and treatment plans. And in the accounting screen, the same thing here, display standard fee and adjustments on walkout. Do you guys have that checked? On um, accounting, we do not. Okay. And insurance, we do not. Okay, so I'm going to show you the difference because you probably haven't seen this in your normal walkouts, but I'll show you the difference of mine so you don't have to change yours. Okay. So because I have this display standard fee and adjustment on walkout, when I go into my walkout, if it will open, I'm going to open up the last guy we're working on. And notice I have a column here. Oops, come on for standard fee adjustment, and then the fee I'm charging today, insurance. So you're missing these two columns. Yeah. You just have fee in your walkout. So now watch when I post a D2393, it shows me here's my standard fee. I'm adjusting off 53.75 down to the allowable of 161. That shows what the insurance is gonna cover. This patient has a discount because they're a friend of mine. <laughs> so they get a discount. And it shows me exactly what the patient's portion is going to be today. Okay. Does that print out on their walkout as well? It does. So let me just see if I can go over to their account and see right there where it's yeah. a standard fee adjustment and fee that will okay. actually walk out. Uh, let's do a. Uh, so does that mean it also will show up on like their statements when they get statements? Yes. Well, no, actually the statement doesn't show it, but only the walkout does. So this okay. would exactly, this is exactly how a walkout would look. So a lot of people okay. are concerned because they don't want somebody to see that it's only a $79 profi. So mine actually shows it's $110 profi that we adjust off $31. So it's $79 and the SBA insurance is 79. And you're using a fee schedule right now, not a coverage book, correct? Right. Well, either way, okay. it would show the same way. So okay. fee schedule or coverage book would still show the same difference in fees. But because I, again, in this guy's setup, I only have a couple of things in the coverage book. It, it's not going to be, it's, again, it's going to be 1% of the time instead of 99% of the time. Okay. Yep. But I like this. The only difference is, you know, a typical walkout 
um, your typical walkout would have three lines exam for Bitewings Profi. Mine's got nine lines right. of information. But in order to be able to show that difference in uh, the f standard fee down to the fee that I'm charging today, it shows that way. I think it also helps explain, we have a lot of patients that ask like, I don't understand how you got that number. <laughs> so exactly. I usually have to end up writing it by hand, but that shows it all automatically. Yep. That's nice. And you can, you can turn that on and off at will, because like I said, if you turn it on and you realize, you know what, I don't like this or it's confusing my patients or whatever, turn it back off. Or if you yeah. like what you're going through, if you find that it's not working out, turn it on, print it for one patient and you know, so you, you can turn that on and off if you've got the security clearance at will um, and be able to decide if you like it or not. I like it. Um, I think it, especially when we're in network, it really does clarify to the patient that they're having a thousand dollar crown for $700. Right. Yeah. So I, I do like that. So really easy way that you guys can see that in the walkout, those three columns. And what I always tell offices, if you don't have a fee, so D, let me just see, um, D to O. All right, so you can see right here that this is really screwed up because my normal fee for Invisalign is $4,600 and it's knocking off the whole $4,600. So it's saying I've charged the patient absolutely nothing. I know something's wrong with that. Right. So I can immediately see I need to go fix my fee schedule to make sure that that's correct before I do anything else on this. Okay. So, you know, that's why I like having that column show up because if I didn't have that column showing up, it would just show this fee column and say, oh, our normal fees is zero. What's going on there? Right. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a real problem. I, I kind of knew that was in that system. I just didn't know which codes they were. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's a great tool for everybody to have. If you're going to use fee schedules and or coverage books, if you set up your system and I'll show everybody again, so they don't have to rewind back into preferences. All right. In the accounting tab, it's display standard fee and adjustments on walkouts and treatment plans. That's what adds that other column in the walkout screen. Okay. Under the insurance tab is what will allow you to print that on the uh, walkout statements. So kind of two separate areas of doing that. Cool. That's a neat trick. <laughs> yeah, I like it. And again, some people hate it because it's, you know, it makes the, the walkout statement so much longer, but to me, I love it. Um, while we're here, let me just, I don't know if, if people know this. So let me just, while we're doing a walkout, um, let me clear this entire walkout and show everybody. Okay. So imagine I get a family of three coming in and this, you know, kind of one of what I wanted to do with these um, webinars is to show people that when we get back up and running, if we start doing some of this stuff ahead of time, then we're ready to rock and roll when people start coming back in, you know, cross our fingers in, in April, May, whatever it's going to be. But let's just say the entire family of three comes in. So Charles, Mary Ann, Tim come in today. What I always do is people are always saying, you know, well, should I wait or should I do it? I like to wait until all three are done. And let's just say it's mom with three or two kids. So what I would do is I would grab Mary, her services pop up, and I can see that my back office has already checked off their services. And I say yes. Then I'm just going to click over to Tim and well, they didn't check it in the back, but I'll check it for them. So Tim had a profi, and then I'm going to go up to Charles. And it looks like they didn't check off anything there. Oh, yeah, they did. And use those services. Come on. So now all three have been checked off. I can verify what they had done. And obviously something's wrong here because Charles had two cleanings. Maybe his teeth were really that dirty. All right. And now I can see that the patient has a copayment of 289.21 based on my fee schedules and everything else, and I can add payments. So imagine today they gave me $100 on a visa. I apply that. And now they still owe me $189. So I'm going to add another payment. And they gave me cash of 50 bucks. I'm going to add that too. And because we're in Pennsylvania and this is an Amish family and they brought us pies, Right. That's so we're going to say <laughs> add payment and we're going to say they gave us in a barter pies worth the difference of 
$139.21. We have a patient that pays with cows. <laughs> I love it. It's the best thing about our area, right? Yeah. So now I have one walkout with everybody on it. And all I have to do is hit save. I'm not going to do it because I don't mess up my database. But if I hit save, it will give me three things that say, do I want to submit now, submit later, write electronically, submit now, submit later. And it will go through that same process three times. And I'll have one receipt that prints with all that information you just saw. On it. That's what we do. That's awesome. So much easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that they, and then, or they'll, they'll go over here to account payment and they'll have a receipt for the payment and then they'll have a receipt for the walkout and it'll be two separate things. So yeah, that's a, that's a great way for everybody to be able to do your walkouts. Uh, but I really wanted everybody to see that fee and adjustment column there. All right. I'll clear that out. So tell me some of the things that you like doing with your, uh, your, um, your system and what, what's the thing that like, what's your favorite part of Eagles off? Well, I do like, I do like the coverage books only because it's helped us figure out what we should be collecting at walkout. Yeah. However, I'm interested of the fee schedules now that you're saying that. Well, the, the great thing, and the way I talk about fee schedules is, you know, I mean, think about, think about trees and leaves. All right. It's so much easier to, to like pick up a tree and, and, and move it than to pick up the leaves and to pick up the branches and then to pick up the limbs and then to pick up the trunks. So if I can work from the biggest part and get rid of that fastest, it's easier because we know that the fee schedules don't change very often. Right. Um, so if I can go in here and I can set up the fee schedule, oops, wrong one. If I can set up my fee schedules and I can see when they were last updated. So let's just look at the premiere. If I can go in here and I can fix my fee schedule and I have percentages attached to those fee schedules, I don't need coverage books other than those posterior resins. But if I don't, and remember there's one fee schedule for 9,000 employers. Right. So I can do that once as opposed to creating coverage books for 9,000 employers. So imagine 2021 Delta has some epiphany and they finally give us a, a you know, an increase in fees. Yeah. You know, right. <laughs> I have to, all I have to do is go in and do one thing, which is, is to change my Delta fee schedule. Okay. Instead of touching every single a coverage million. book. Yeah. Yep. So that's why I said, I'd rather, you know, again, if I, if I'm cutting down a tree, I'd rather cut the tree down and go take off every single you know, leaf. And that just makes it easier for me. Right. And yes, everybody. So you know that you can update a fee schedule while everybody's in the system. If you uncheck these two boxes, I can go here and change to 162. All right, hit okay. If I don't do that, 161, it's gonna say, hey, dummy, you can't do this. There are people in your system. So I don't have anybody in my system, but there you go. So I can do that and I can fix all of my uh, people, uh, all of my Delta premieres in one fell swoop, but otherwise I'd have to go to coverage book and go through every single coverage book and edit those and update those. Yeah. So, and those service types were under list, general setup and service types. And these, there's a list of these in the Facebook group. This is okay. the setup that I have. Um, give you an example of how crazy the service types are. If you think about the typical Prosto removable service type that's in our system, mm -hmm. it says most of us, when we call insurance companies, we find out what's the coverage for removables. And the coverage is typically 50% right. for dentures. But 99% of the removable codes are covered at 80% because it's mostly adjustments, relines, that right. stuff. It's only like five codes, or not five, but eight codes that we use in a dental office, the full dentures, the partial dentures, the flexi dentures, those kind of things. There's like eight of those that we typically use that are covered at 50%. Okay. So what I do is I create, a, I just rename my Prosto removable, Prosto repairs and adjustments, leave that at 80%. And I create a new one called Prosto removable for the dentures, at 50%. So that's my new service type. 
Now what I have to do is go to list and service codes, go down to my dentures, and now I can edit these to include them in the 50% category where all my adjustments are at 80%. That makes sense. Yep. So, and that will get you more accurate treatment plans and walkouts. Exactly. Because if you post the denture and uh, a realign, imagine you're doing an immediate denture. So your immediate denture is going to go in at 50%, but the relines that have to be done are going to go in at 80%. Right. Yeah. So it's an easy way to do that, but each of these has to go in. You have to go in and you have to change your service type to match the new service types that you had. Um, and you might have to go in and tweak your, your existing employers as you do that. Let me just okay. show you what, what I mean. If I go to my service types and I create a new one. Fun stuff. And I say fun stuff is covered at 50% or 56%. It's going to say, do I want to apply that to every one of my employers? I can say no, because I'm not, I'm not sure what fun stuff is going to be covered under, you know, XYZ employer, I can say no. And then each one I go, oh, AARP does cover fun stuff at 80%, but the deductible applies. So I can do that for each employer, but I like leaving, okay. you're going to create a new one, leave them at zero to start, and then you can update it as you go. Okay. All right. Fun stuff. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, I'm going to cancel that. Um, everybody should have a, a product um, category. Um, in Pennsylvania, um, we're taxed on over-the-counter products that we distribute. So if we're selling an, a, a, an Oral-B brush or something like that, we're taxed on that. So we should be keeping track of the amount of product that we distribute out of the practice. So it's a good idea to have a separate category for that. Um, I think whitening pens, things like that are considered product. So it's a great way to sort of create a category for those things. A lot of times offices have those just under adjunctive. Um, so it's a good way to put that in. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, and this is a great time uh, as we're going through this process to um, start to clean up your service code list. As you can see, I re I've renamed every one of my service codes so that they're really clear. But this is the one like ocular prosthesis. If you're, if you're never ever going to do an ocular prosthesis in your office, this is a time to go in and edit and make that an inactive code so that when you look at your code list, it's clean. Um, it's a great time to get that out. Um, I don't know many offices are doing you know, maxillofacial prosthetics, but it's a great time to clean up your list to get those things out of there. Um, you know, now that we've got some downtime forced or not, it's a great time to try to clean up some of these things. That makes sense. Cool. Let's see. I think we probably have another like five minutes. Is there anything else you want me to hit on while we're, while we're on the call? Are you doing a webinar specific to fee schedules? I can. Or can uh, you dive a little bit into it now or can we do another one that goes yeah, on fee schedules? We can do another one. Yeah, we can do another one just on fee schedules. Um, you know, the, the great thing is I think almost every office that I go in has a binder either on a shelf or under the desk that has all of the fee schedules that they yep. typically will reference. The great thing is um, we probably in most dental offices do about 35, let's call it 75 of the 9,999 codes. Um, so if we just team up, you know, you get two people and we open up a fee schedule and I, I'll just new and let's see which one don't I don't have here. All right. So let's just say, I want to individually set up these codes. I never automatically set up all codes. So I want to individually set up the codes. All right. And I'm going to make this guardian. And I'm, I'm putting this in on 320. All right, but what I try to tell people, look at the bottom of your fee schedule, and it usually has a effective date on it. Date, yep. yeah. So, oops. Uh, one of 2019, whatever. Okay, and then start setting up your codes. And then, you, you know, like if you and I were doing it, I'd call off to you, I'd say, okay, 120, 150, 140, 170. So all the codes that you do, D0120. And then we put in the allowable fee. So remember, this is our, based on our contract, they allow us to charge $27. And then go to the next one. 
and then put all the, like I said, the 75 codes that you do in this, in this system. Uh, the best thing about doing it that way is you won't have that situation where you saw me put in the ortho code and came up with a zero fee. Right. All right. This is, this will ignore those codes that, you know, we can charge whatever we want to charge or that there is no, you know, um, there's nothing in the contract that has us at a set code. So if, you so go if we this, don't have something in there, um, if it's not even in the fee schedule, so it doesn't even have a line item, yep. it, it shows up as our fee, correct? It'll, it doesn't it'll, do yeah. what the ortho does. It'll default to the standard fee. Okay. Yep. So yours showed up on the ortho because you had the line item and it had like zero or something. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And people have to be really careful because if you don't have like, if you don't have a standard fee in for something, imagine, and this actually happened in one of our offices, we had a patient present who had a, a BB stuck in their tissue oh from gosh. when they were a kid and it showed up on an x-ray and they were like in their fifties and wow. we needed to, the doctor had to remove it and there's a code for it, a removal of a foreign object. So the doctor removed it, but because it had never been set up in the fee schedule or I'm sorry, in our standard fees as a fee, the fee in the fee schedule was zero and it would never okay. go to insurance because it was a zero charge. Right. And we did charge the guy, you know, whatever, a couple hundred bucks to remove it. But because the fee was zero, it wouldn't go to insurance, even though we wow. forced a fee in there that day. And yeah. I kept saying, how come this won't go out? How come what? And that's why it wouldn't go out because the standard fee in the system was zero. It wouldn't go okay. out to the insurance. So if there's ever a procedure you're going to be doing, make sure it has a fee attached to it, even if it's something you randomly, you know, rarely ever going to do. Okay. But that's how I set up my fee schedules. I literally go through and I like to do, you know, team up with somebody and have people call off or go through and just red line or, or you know, yellow highlight right. all the services you do in the office and only put in those codes that you actually do. That makes it easier when it comes time to update it. Instead of updating 9,999 codes, you update the ones that you do. Right. And then once it's in, it's in your list and you got it. And you have, when, you know, when the, uh, the next ice age comes and they update it, that's when you can go through and update your fees again. Okay. And then you make sure that you're attaching those fee schedules to your employers. And again, it's, you're not worried about updating coverage books every time you get an EOB. Right. And that just, you know, that's like pulling weeds, you know? Yeah. So just stay consistent with, with doing it and you don't have to worry about it. Let's that see. makes sense. Cool. I just want to look at the timeline and make sure it's not going to cut us off. All right. So what else can you think of? Well, we got you. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, what we'll do is, and again, the good thing is because we've, you know, we've got downtime, you know, if there's something you can think of, we can also record another one because the good thing is if you've got a question, you know, out of the 8,000 or almost 9,000 people in the group, somebody else has got a question. Yeah. So it's a great time to be able to do that. But yeah, fee schedules and coverage books are one of those things like, you know, every time I go in offices and they've got tons and tons of coverage books, they also have tons and tons of work keeping those things updated. Right. And for me, I think that using just fee schedules makes it so that I don't have to do a lot of updates. Maybe once a year, I've got to update the MetLife fee schedule. But right. other than that, it's not that much work. And coverage books to, to me are a lot of work. Now, do you do them for out of network as well? So out of network, I'd be using just coverage books and I'd be doing okay. it as co-pays, you know, okay. that if I'm going to estimate, but, um, and I have in the group kind of my theory on if you're out of network, you have three choices. You either are out of network and you don't care, which means you don't even estimate. You just, you know, fake it. And usually what I do with offices like that, I'll put in a hundred for preventive, um, 60 to 70 for my basic and then like 30 to 40 for my major stuff. Um, and I will estimate and say, we really have no idea what your insurance covers, but here's the thing. Or you put zeros and you say, Hey, you submit this to your insurance and what they pay, they pay and you pay me today. So it depends on how deep you want to get into an out of network situation, but okay. you can kind of pick and choose how you, how you set that up. But, we do yeah, a little but, bit of that because like United Concordia pays the patient. So ours are like all patient based, like they pay it to us and then they keep the check. Exactly. But we have MetLife who we're not participating with, but they pay more than what they pay if we are participating. Yep. 
So. And that's a good way to do the coverage books. Okay. Yeah. And again, the, the problem is the we're, we're still guesstimating, but based on the EOBs that we get back, we can be close enough. Okay. And what I do with, again, when I get an EOB back, that's when I'll build my coverage book. Okay. I'm actually looking at what they paid. What do you do in a situation where a patient, like we don't participate with Medicare, okay. but we um, will submit the claim for them. Mm -hmm. Do you just go in and uncheck track claim? Like how do you, so yeah. you just don't have like a million claims open that. Yeah. Anything really... that I'm, and again, this goes back to being out of network. Anything that like, like you said with United Concordia, if it's United Concordia and we don't track the claims, I don't think I have anything set up here in United Concordia, but let me just choose one. If we're not tracking the claim in preferences, I'm going to mark do not track claim, which automatically makes the patient responsible for all. So what happens is a claim is generated, it gets sent, but I don't have it in my open claims. Okay. All right. Now, a lot of people are like, well, but how do you follow up with that to make sure the patient got their check? Honestly, I don't care. Right. <laughs> because, you know, if they don't get a check, believe me, they're going to call you. Right. They're on, they're, they're, they're doing the outstanding claims report, you know? Right. So I, I could care less about that because I know that the patient's going to do the follow up. So I would just mark it as do not track claim. The claim goes out, it opens okay. and closes by itself and it's out of my hair. Do you still get ERAs if you do not track the claim? It de Well, yeah, you'll get it um, depending on the insurance company. Okay. If the insurance company typically sends you a, um, an EOB, then you will. But if there's, okay. a, you know, some plans don't give you any information, you're right. not going to get it. Yeah, you're not going to yeah. get it at all. Okay. And again, that's why I said, you, you know, based on your, you know, your patient population, that kind of stuff. Some people you need it for, some people you don't. But for the most part, I'm always marking things that uh, as do not track claim when it's something that I'm not a, a participating provider for. Okay. Yep. Cool. Well, I think it's going to cut us off. So Katie, thanks for doing this. And uh, yeah. I'm going to post this out there. And if there's anything, anything else you think of that you want to do um, uh, a video on, let me know. We'll, we'll record something else. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Stay safe out there. Tell everybody in the office I said hello. I will. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Thanks.